gentlemen, unless you're scared, start your engines! He has been called the greatest race car driver on the planet. Now at age 27, Jeff Gordon has transcended the sport he dominates to become one of the most marketed athletes in the world. Tonight we go behind closed doors and behind the wheel with the man who drives car number 24. After just six years on the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, Jeff Gordon is rewriting the record books. He already has 43 career victories and three driving championships to his name. But amazingly, he doesn't even own the car he drives. He is paid $1.5 million a year by Hendrick Motorsports to put their car in the winner's circle. Well, there's no telling what he's going to make out of this business. He could be as big as Michael Jordan because, one, he has the looks, two, he has the personality, and three, and the most important thing of all, he has the opportunity. Just to put it in perspective, in 1998, Jeff Gordon also raked in $4 million in victory purses, $3 million from sponsors, and over $5.5 million from sales of licensed merchandise. Get her hat, please! We had an all-access pass to Jeff Gordon and his team over one week of racing. It was like traveling with a rock star. Jeff! 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 I talked with him behind closed doors in a special luxury box overlooking the Atlanta Motor Speedway. It's funny, it looks really slow for me. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think it looks really fast. <laughs> I'm told that you've been doing this since age five? Yes. Uh, well, not quite at this level or anything <laughs> like this, but yeah, my, my stepfather and my mother got me uh, involved in racing. When, actually, the first time I ever drove a car, I was about four, four and a half. Car racing consumed a young Jeff Gordon, but his competitive streak was tempered by a shy exterior. Give a kiss. Uh, oh, come on, give a kiss. Come on, come on, Jeffrey. That's part of winning the trophy. By age eight, he was already a national champion. At age 11, Jeff dominated the go-kart division. At 14, he started racing sprint cars. I always knew that I wanted to drive a race car. And I guess, you know, just like other kids, when they start to think about career, I was thinking, OK, do I continue on with racing, or do I go to college? What do I do? The day I graduated, that night I was racing, and I had one of the best races I ever had. And I knew right then, this is, this is what I need to pursue. Among those three. Our journey with Jeff began at the Las Vegas 400. Moments after his third place finish, Jeff and his wife, Brooke, were ferried by private helicopter to his private Lear jet. While Jeff and Brooke were jetting to their Florida home, Jeff's team packed his million dollar mobile garage for the next leg of NASCAR's traveling circus. Inside, they loaded two of Jeff's race cars into the top tier of the truck. Below, there are enough spare parts to build an entire engine within 10 minutes. After traveling cross country, everyone would meet up at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Jeff and Brooke arrived 72 hours before the race. Like most raceways, Atlanta is set up like a mini city. Inside the one and a half mile oval racetrack, drivers and their crews will eat, sleep, and live racing. There is a garage area for the race cars and a restricted zone that acts as a luxury mobile home park. Jeff and Brooks spend as many as 34 weekends a year in his 45-foot, million-dollar motor coach, seen here for the first time on television. We're in the motor coach a lot, and, and so it has to have all the comforts of home. We have a full kitchen in there and a bedroom and satellite television, so I'm able to watch all the races. Jeff and Brooke are inseparable at the racetrack. In fact, their entire romance is a NASCAR fairy tale. Well, we were in Daytona, and it was his first Daytona 500. He was a rookie that year, and we were both 21. And I was the girl that gave the trophy to who won in Victory Lane. And it was Valentine's Day, and he asked me out for lunch, and we've been together ever since. Good luck, Jeff. Good luck, Jeff. Good luck. Do you have what they say is a, the need for speed? 
Um, now my wife might answer this a different yeah, way. Yeah, I was wondering, do you, <laughs> and then do you I take would. a couple corners just a little faster than the rest of us out there? Oh, I might get in a hurry every once in a while. Well, you have to be like the ultimate backseat driver, I'm right? I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm the worst backseat driver. I mean, anybody you talk to that that will you know that I've ridden with will tell you. Gosh, every corner, it doesn't matter what lane we're in, he's like, no, switch lanes, you know, no, pass that car, get up there, turn around. Uh, I can't help that. <laughs> What is it that separates Jeff from the rest of the pack? He has the best car. He is the best driver. He does have the best crew. He's got all the financing in the world. So he's got everything it takes. And he has a really good crew chief. That crew chief is Ray Evernham. He acts as the field general for a 37-man crew that keeps putting Jeff in the winner's circle. Ray took us behind his closed garage doors for an inside look at Jeff's car. So the car was performing well today? It has a little bit of what we call a push or a tight condition. Now, when a driver says the car's tight, that means he's turning the steering wheel and the car doesn't want to turn. It's trying to go straight. And then you'll hear him say the car's loose, and that means it's turning without him turning it. So this car has a little bit of a tight condition, which is good because you don't really want a loose car at 200 miles an hour. Uh-uh. Although Jeff's Chevy Monte Carlo cost about $125,000, it comes with no frills. There's no passenger seat, no speedometer, no doors, and the headlights are only decals. The engine itself cost almost $40,000, but is engineered to last only six hours. Each one of Jeff's 12 identical cars is built from the ground up around a steel roll cage designed to protect the driver. Friday and Saturday, Jeff drove qualifying and practice runs to get the feel of the track. Here in Atlanta, Jeff had the eighth fastest qualifying time. From this point on, he won't drive or even see his car again until the start of the race. When we come back, it's race day and Jeff goes for the checkered flag. Behind Closed Doors will continue in a moment here on a and &E. Race day doesn't begin with racing. For Jeff, rain or shine, it actually begins four hours before he puts the pedal to the metal. You do this every Sunday? Every Sunday. Unlike athletes in other sports, Jeff's pre-race rituals don't focus on how to win the event. Instead, behind closed doors, he meets and greets his sponsors and their guests. These obligations continue right up until race time. Good to see you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. While Jeff is mingling with his sponsors, his crew fills up his car with 22 gallons of high-octane gas. Cost, $4.11 per gallon. Remember that when you're under a yellow flag, you Next, we went with Jeff behind closed doors to a mandatory meeting for all drivers. Have cooperation and respect for each other out on this fast racetrack. Simultaneously, Jeff's crew was walking the car through NASCAR's inspection process. Since all of these race cars are virtually identical, NASCAR makes sure they adhere to strict racing limits. After inspection, Jeff's Monte Carlo is pushed to the starting line, gassed, tuned, and ready. That's good. Finally, Jeff and the other drivers attend a church service. They know every time they go to work, there's a chance of not coming back alive. When you're out there going at those speeds, what are you thinking about? There's a little bit of fear there, you know, because any little problem, you, and it's, you know, you can blow a tire, you can run over something on the track, uh, the car can get away from you, and you know it's going to hurt a lot when you hit that wall. Thirty minutes before the race, I joined Jeff on his walk to Pitt Road for driver introductions. I was amazed at how calm he seemed. When you're going that fast around that racetrack, trust me, your mind's not thinking about anything else but that. Starting eight from Pittsburgh, Indiana, driving to number 24, DuPont Automotive finishes Chevrolet, Jeff Gordon. Surprisingly, Jeff Gordon often hears as many boos from the crowd as he does cheers. There's times when I'm booed when I come out for driver introductions, but I realize that those are the dedicated fans to their driver and to their team, and I'm, you know, the enemy. But yet, then there are the cheers and the people that pull for me, and they're very dedicated to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. Jeff and his wife, Brooke, have a race day tradition. For inspiration, Brooke chooses a scripture from the Bible and has a crew member tape it to Jeff's steering wheel. Before he climbs into the car, they also take a private moment for a short prayer. We pray especially for wisdom and safety to be given to him. Good luck. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks for being here. Most of Jeff's races are 500 miles. On this day with rain delays, he would be behind the wheel for over four hours, almost double his normal time. It is almost race time and the noise level is increasing. In a moment, these 43 cars will start their engines and race against one another at speeds approaching 200 miles per hour. And when the green flag is waved, all eyes will be on car number 24. This was my first NASCAR race. I got a bird's eye view of the action from the team's pit. I'll never forget the noise and excitement of these 43 cars battling for the lead at speeds more than three times the legal limit. Ray was in constant contact with Jeff through a two-way radio. They discussed race strategy and how the car was handling. All right, Jeff, hustling around at 10, 10, 10. Watch your pit road entry speed. He can see the whole picture from where he's at because he's taking times of hitting my car, other cars. I see what's happening in that box of steel, that race car, and what's in front of me and behind me, and that's it. So I'm, I need that. Four tires, two cans. All right, that's going to be loose on me now, all right? This is pit row, and Jeff's crew will go over the wall, attacking the race car like Marines storming the beach. They'll change four tires, refuel the car with up to 22 gallons of gas, and clean the windshield, and they'll do it all in less than six seconds. Ray has revolutionized the pit stop. While most teams have their mechanics work on the car, Ray flies in a specially trained crew known as the Rainbow Warriors the morning of the race. The leader of the pit crew, Andy Papathanasiu, has a degree in organizational behavior from Stanford and has used it to fine tune the pitting process. Anytime you try to do something with seven people, in 16 seconds, working with 75 pounds of tires and 85 pounds of gas cans, you need to know your steps and exactly what you're doing at every moment, or uh, that could easily turn into a disaster. There are an average of five pit stops during a race. These tires cost $400 a piece, and up to 20 may be used in a single race. They have no tread and are designed to stick to the track when they heat up. Someone asked me once what separates a good pit crew from a bad pit crew, and I said, honestly, about half a second. Okay, five to go. You've got breathing room. Pick your traffic. Five to go. After 400 miles, Jeff Gordon has climbed in the first place. The temperature in his car can get up to 120 degrees. The G-forces of over 900 left turns batter the body. You have to be very sharp. You have to, you know, really be focused. And you're concentrating so hard on what's happening in front of you and what your car is doing that you could stick needles in my body and I probably wouldn't even know it. Jeff Gordon wins the Cracker Barrel 500 at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Another victory for Jeff Gordon and the Rainbow Warriors. It was a perfect ending to our week with Jeff Gordon. I joined him in victory lane and took part in the celebration of win number 44. So what will you do tonight? We'll kind of relive that for the next you know, a couple days in. This is my week to be able to be on top, you know, and once we get to the next race, you go back to zero. Well, thanks for a great beginning to a major new fan. We said goodbye, Jeff signed a few last autographs, and NASCAR's hottest young driver was off to the races again.